is a frequent speaker uh, to publisher and library groups on topics ranging from intellectual property to scholarly communication to the future of librarianship and leads the International Librarian Rock Band, The Bearded Kids. I gotta, I gotta check that out. So, uh, please welcome T. Scott Kluchak. Thanks, Steve. Um, hi there. How are y'all? Um, I'm really, I'm very happy to be here. Um, delighted and honored to be able to kick off the, the show for what I hope will be a really great conference for all of you. Um, I hope that the somewhat ponderous title of my talk isn't filling you all with existential dread. Um, I'll, I'll try not to be um, too uh, dour as we go through it, and I'll, I'll uh, explain uh, momentarily where the, uh, where the title came from. Uh, but I want to get a little sense first of who's here, because I know that NASA gets kind of a broad um, attendance. Um, how many of you, by show of hands, are not librarians working in a library? Okay, so I assume a mix of uh, people from uh, publishers, vendors, maybe some librarians who are not working in a library, like me, for example. Um, so of the librarians who are working in libraries, how many are in a library that has an institutional repository? Yes, well, there you go. Um, of those, how many of you are actively involved with that institutional repository? Okay, so a good number. Um, and then for the group as a whole, um, how many of you have had conversations with colleagues about the scope and purpose of an institutional repository? Yeah, so we know that this is one of the big topics in librarianship. We've been talking for the last 10 years that um, institutional repositories offer an opportunity for librarians to do some new things, to add value to their institutions, uh, to take on new roles, all of these, these sorts of things. And what I want to do today is kind of offer some reflections on my thinking about institutional repositories as they've developed, um, ask some questions about what I think has been working and what hasn't been, uh, and make some suggestions about uh, where I think some uh, efforts for institutional repositories ought to be focused in the future. I'm going to try to do this in about 45 minutes or so, so we've got some time for questions and discussions afterwards, and you can let me know what you think and where you think I've gone terribly wrong, and um, correct me if you can. Um, but before I do that, I want to amplify a little bit what, what Steve said about my background. This is sort of my um, competing interests section where I try to give you a little bit of sense of my biases to help you figure out what I have to say that you can just completely discount and what might be worth listening to. Um, so Steve says, I'm Director of Digital Data Curation Strategies now at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Uh, I work out of the provost's office, so this is not a library-driven uh, activity. Um, my job is to work across the university to try to figure out how we develop, as an institution, uh, infrastructure policy and services to manage research data. And I think doing it outside of the library has given me a really interesting uh, change of perspective that I'm not sure I would have had if I was still working within the library. Now, having said that, I am a librarian through and through. I started uh, with postgrad work at the National Library of Medicine, worked at St. Louis University. I was 19 years as director of the Lister Hill Library at UAB. Um, Steve mentioned that I was editor of the Journal of the Medical Library Association, uh, a really formative experience that helped me think about scholarly publishing from the standpoint of a small society publisher. Uh, one of the things that I'm most proud of was the opportunity to be involved with the Scholarly Publishing Roundtable back in 2009. This was a very small group. There were 14 of us brought together at the request of the U.S. Congress and the White House to try to develop consensus opinions on how to make the products of federally funded research publicly available. So we had three librarians, three university provosts, representatives from Elsevier, from PLOS, from a couple of other publishers. Uh, we had some research support. 
Uh, we were able to come up with some consensus opinions, even with that diverse a group. We issued our report in early 2010, and our recommendations were incorporated into the OSTP memo of 2013, which instructed the federal agencies to develop the policies for open access to publications and data that we are all dealing with now. And then I always like to mention, when I'm talking to an audience of librarians, particularly people who are involved with serials, that for over 20 years I have been married to Lynn Fortney, uh, recently retired uh, as director of the biomedical division of EBSCO Information Services, and yes, for over 20 years, after dinner, over that last glass of wine, we have often been talking about cereals. <laughs> um, it's pretty hardcore. Um, Steve mentioned that I'm, I'm on the editorial board for a number of journals, so I try to look at publishing from that standpoint. I am or have been on the library advisory boards for a number of organizations. So I've done a variety of things over the years that have enabled me to spend time with a lot of the different stakeholders of the scholarly communication ecosystem. And what I take away from that is it's complicated. Um, and there are lots and lots of people of goodwill in all sectors working really hard to try to figure out how we move things forward, how we innovate, how we do a better job of sharing information. Um, and that goes for people in all sectors. So unlike some of my librarian colleagues, I don't perceive publishers as the enemy. I perceive them as valued colleagues who, even though we may fight and argue, have a lot to learn from each other. I'm very committed to open access in the sense that I think the results of research need to be shared as widely as possible, but I've never been a fan of the spark approach towards a legislative uh, adversarial confrontational role. Um, what I've tried to do throughout my career is ask questions, is to look for partners, and to try to see how we can do the best job we can moving things forward. So that kind of informs my thinking uh, about institutional repositories, librarianship, scholarly communication in general. So when I was asked to do this talk and I started thinking about how I wanted to shape things for um, talking about institutional repositories, which had been on my mind, uh, I went to a session at the Charleston conference that was run by a number of people associated with this book, which was launched during the Charleston conference, uh, making institutional repositories work. And I wonder, is there anybody here who was involved with that book, either any of the editors, any of the authors? Uh, well, um, you really, if you're at all interested in institutional repositories, I really recommend getting a copy of the book, checking it out. Um, there's a lot of really good stuff in there to agree with, to disagree with, but it really has helped me frame my thoughts. And from the get-go, the foreword is written by Clifford Lynch. Uh, Lynch is the executive director of the Coalition for Network Information. He's been doing that since the late 90s. Uh, before that, he was um, director of library automation for the University of California. Um, he's written a lot. He's spoken a lot. He really is one of the smartest people that I know of thinking about digital information, digital libraries, uh, and so whenever he writes or speaks, I really pay attention. And he says right at the beginning of his foreword, he talks about a paper that he wrote back in 2003 in which he talked about his vision of institutional repositories that was really focused on uh, innovation and new forms of information. And he says that this vision stands in contrast to a well-articulated alternative view that casts institutional repositories first and primarily as mechanisms to support a transition of the traditional scholarly journal to open access models. This dialectic, still unresolved, is well illustrated in the chapters of this volume. So as a guy with an undergraduate degree in philosophy, I thought, great, this is what I need. I will explore this dialectic. Um, so what I want to do is kind of tease out these issues and see where it takes us a dozen, 13 years later. Now, Lynch doesn't mention by name where this alternative view came from, 
but he was almost certainly thinking about Raym Crow. Uh, Raym Crow, senior consultant at Spark, back in um, 2002, so a year before the paper that uh, Lynch refers to, the case for institutional repositories, a Spark position paper, um, that you see referred to over and over and over. And he outlined within a very comprehensive and very sophisticated analysis what he refers to as two strategic issues. And they were that institutional repositories, and this is the, the point that Lynch was referring to, can be used to reform scholarly communication by developing an alternative disaggregated model for scholarly publishing that would expand access because it would be based on open access models. It would reassert control of scholarly publishing, bring it back into universities. By doing that, it would increase competition with traditional publishers, and that would result in some economic relief for libraries. Secondarily, he saw institutional repositories as a mechanism for demonstrating the significance of the institution's research activities. You could fill your institutional repository with the published research of your faculty, and that would help to show what your university was producing um, for all of the reasons that we would want to highlight that. Now, Lynch's paper comes out a year later in an ARL uh, bi-monthly report, uh, Institutional Repositories, Essential Infrastructure for Scholarship. And Lynch takes a somewhat different approach. He sees three elements for institutional repositories. To manage, provide access to, and preserve new forms of digital scholarship. So where Crow is interested in competing in traditional publishing, Lynch makes a distinction between scholarly publishing and scholarly communication. And he's interested in looking at new forms, new ways of getting information out that have not typically been in the traditional publication stream. He wants to use institutional repositories to nurture innovation in all forms of scholarly communication and then to facilitate the preservation and reuse of evidence underlying scholarly work, in other words, the data. So Lynch is looking quite differently from the vision that Crow has. They're not, they're not um, in opposition to each other, but they are different in scope and different in direction. They have some commonalities. They're both interested in using institutional repositories to reshape the scholarly communication landscape. They both want to use them to bring a measure of control back into academia. But they have some significant differences, where Crow is very focused on this transition from traditional publication to open access models. Lynch is much less concerned with traditional publication and really wants to use innovation to supplement and complement traditional publication by making available things that have not been available in any form before. So what's happened since? in the 13, 14 years since they issued their papers. Well, we do see that institutional repositories have a wide range of material in them. Um, so some of what Lynch hoped for is indeed coming along. Uh, electronic theses and dissertations have been a big thing for a lot of repositories. Um, student work is getting into repositories. Uh, teaching materials, a lot of multimedia stuff, lots of things that unless you were on a particular university campus, you were never going to have access to are now being shared with the world through institutional repositories. We are seeing an increasing awareness of the importance of data. In my current role, this is of particular interest to me. It's taken longer, I think, than Lynch expected for that to really take off. But certainly over the last five years, we've seen increasing amounts of attention on that. At the same time, there is a continuing focus on traditional peer-reviewed articles, primarily in the form of green open access. And what we've seen is how difficult it has turned out to be to actually get that kind of content in. And I think that, I think Crow envisioned 
and people who were setting up institutional repositories in the early 2000s anticipated they were going to be able to get faculty to really move a lot of their content in and really fill the institutional repository with either open access versions of record or at least green open access copies. And that has turned out to be extremely difficult. So we've seen a growing emphasis on open access mandates as a way to try to drive that content. And I would argue that as this has been going on, we have not paid nearly enough attention to issues of interoperability among institutional repositories, which was a key feature of what both Lynch and Crow were talking about. So I want to go back and look at Crow's strategic issues and kind of see where we are now compared to what we knew then. And I want to start with his second one, this demonstrating the significance of the institution's research activities. Um, Crow envisioned being able to fill the repository with versions of published articles and that that was going to be a mechanism for highlighting the institution's research activities. That's turned out to be very hard to do. At the same time, we've seen the emergence of new systems, research management systems, that do an extremely effective job at exactly that. Um, these systems provide uh, faculty profiles that pull in metadata for all of the published content, and not just published content, but can provide a complete picture of faculty output, looking at publications, grants, teaching, so you can really start to develop a full picture of the activity of an institution, and they provide analytical tools that can support ways to really highlight that significance and develop um, collaborative tools. Uh, to bring researchers within an institution or for other institutions together. So I'm thinking of things like elements uh, from a Symplectic, a company in the UK. There's Vivo, which uh, is an open source product that is used by a lot of institutions in the health sciences that have uh, NIH funding. Uh, Elsevier has a system called Pure that does the same kind of thing. And when you start to connect these with other research information management tools like ORCID identifiers, some of the altmetric uh, tools like Plum Analytics or altmetric, you start to develop an extremely robust system for highlighting the institution's research significance. Here's Duke's scholars at Duke, for example. Uh, this is built on a combination of uh, Symplectic's elements and Vivo. And you see here, you can go, you can search across all of the faculty, all of the research themes. You can uh, really find out where the strengths of Duke research are. You can communicate with them. It's a very, very effective tool. And it can be established without an institutional repository at all. Now, the one downside to this kind of a system, of course, is if you are pointing through uh, the faculty profiles to content that is restricted by license uh, or subscription, you're not providing access to the actual content. Um, so you can see where using an institutional repository to supplement one of these systems might be an effective way to do that. But it's really these systems provide a much more robust way of doing that highlighting than I think Crow envisioned when he saw the institution repository as the primary mechanism for achieving that. Now, what if we look at the second issue, reforming the system, using the IR to support this transition from traditional publishing models? Well, if you go back and you read Crow's paper, he had a really pretty sophisticated and very visionary way of looking at this. And, um, what we typically think of as the four functions of um, traditional publishing. There's registration, which is basically saying, yes, I discovered this. Um, this is mine on such and such a date. Certification, which deals with the peer review process. Awareness, getting it out there so people know that this has been uh, presented. And then archiving, how do you preserve it for the long run? And in his top table, where he looks at traditional academic journal publishing, most of those functions are run by traditional publishers. What he envisioned was this 
disaggregated model where you would use the IR as the platform for getting that initial article out, but then would bring the other functions back into the academy, into academic departments, into academic institutions, into professional societies, and really develop a competitive model to what the traditional publishers were doing. To a very large extent, that has not happened. Um, we've seen some examples with library publishing programs, uh, and some of those are very exciting. There's the Library Publishing Coalition that is really trying to move these things forward. But most institutional repositories have not really done a lot in this area. Instead, what we've seen is this focus on traditional and this is from the uh, Making Institutional Repositories Work uh, book. Traditional model for content within an institutional repository, previously published scholarship in the form of green open access. So we see IR managers continuing to try to gather as much OA content as they can, principally green OA, in order to fill the repository with all of the difficulties that that presents. This has always made me a little queasy. And it's because of what I think of as the inner contradictions of green open access. And I think it raises the question, is green open access really effective as a transition model? And where does it put us as librarians in terms of moving this forward? Green OA is fundamentally parasitic on traditional journals. Um, and by that I mean it owes its existence to a robust non-OA journal environment. Um, if the journal is open access, you can get access to the version of record from the journal, so you obviously don't need a green OA ver version. Green OA, the way it has developed, however, requires the peer review be done by traditional journals. So unlike Crow's vision where peer review would be moved into the academy, Green OA relies on traditional journals and so it fundamentally owes its existence and its viability to the main maintaining of the traditional journal system. So that suggests to me that not only is it not an effective transition model, in a way it almost serves as a block to get into where we want to go. The other thing that troubles me is as we talk about Green OA, you see over and over the argument that embargoes protect publishers. Publishers should not be fussing about Green OA. They should not be fussing about embargoes. In fact, embargoes should be shorter because there's no evidence that any embargoed content has ever caused people to cancel journals. So obviously when publishers complain about this, they're really just digging in their heels and they're trying to prevent people from getting the content. But realistically, we all know that the point of Green OA is to put the publishers out. And you see things like, again, a quote out of the Making Institutional Repositories book, library's primary purpose in archiving faculty research was the motivation to cancel journal subscriptions. So I think we should be sympathetic to our colleagues in publishing when we say, oh, embargoes don't threaten your business model, when at the same time they know what we want to do is threaten their business model. And it makes me uncomfortable because to me it smacks of a little bit of intellectual dishonesty on our part when we try to make these arguments. Now, I'm not just uneasy about how we handle green OA, but there is this focus on filling the institutional repository with any OA content that we can get. So uh, just this week on the Skullcom list uh, that ACRL runs, we see this question comes up. This is from an IR manager, and he's asking the question. He says, we're investigating a variety of options for populating an institutional repository, including harvesting research that is externally available and is open access. So he's not just looking at getting green open access versions, but let's go out to Hindawi or to Biomed Central or to PLOS and find articles that are already open access and get them into our repository so we can fill our repository. And there's a lot of effort being done in that area. And so I look at this and I think, and 
what exactly is the purpose that this is serving? A couple of years ago, I was involved in a project that NISO developed to look at multiple versions of journal articles. And it came up because there was increasing concern that as you go out in the internet, you can find so many different copies of an article, but it's very hard to tell where in the publication cycle they fall. Is this an author's preprint? Has it gone through peer review? Is it the version of record? Has it been corrected or not? Uh, and so we attempted to come up with at least some terminology that you could apply to an article to know where in the life cycle it falls. Uh, Crossref has attempted to tackle this problem with the development of Crossmark, which is a bit of metadata that can be applied to the version of record, and it gives the provenance and it lets you find out, um, is this the version of record? Has this article been corrected? Uh, has it been retracted? Very important information. We know from the work that Retraction Watch has done that um, although retractions and corrections and problems with the literature affect only a very, very small proportion of the literature, it's still significant. It is still a problem. And so I think it raises the question as we are populating institutional repositories with multiple copies of articles, how do we know how that copy relates to the version of record? How do we know if it's been corrected, if it's been retracted? Is it still authoritative? Is it still the version that is best for the reader? And so I think as librarians, I want to look and say, yeah, the green open access model, when it's the only way to get access to content, that's better than no access at all. But what are the potential downsides and what should I as a librarian be doing to try to point people to the best version available? Well, we're now seeing, because of what's happening as a result of federal uh, funding activity in this country, expanded public access to the results of research. So we've got the NIH public access policy that has been very effective over the last number of years in getting content that is the result of federally funded research into PubMed Central. Um, all of the other federal funding agencies are now working on developing similar policies. Many of them are going to use PubMed Central. Others are going to use other uh, repositories. But they're going to be fairly robust, well-tended, well-curated uh, repositories. And I personally would be more comfortable if I am trying to direct somebody to the best version and I can't get them to the actual version of record, I would rather send them to PubMed Central than to some other institutional repository because I think that PubMed Central is going to have better mechanisms in place to track what might be happening with that version of record. Now we've seen in just the last couple of weeks out of the Competitive Council of the EU that there is now an increasing interest on the part of the European Union to make sure that all research published in the EU with public funding is also going to be made open access. We don't know the details of how that's going to happen, but it is very likely it will be similar models to what we've seen in the US. So again, we're going to start to see robust government sanctioned repositories that are filling uh, that gap to provide access to content. So I think when we look at all of these sorts of developments, it puts us in a position of reassessing the role of open access in institutional repositories. And I would suggest that institutional repositories are unnecessary for highlighting institutional achievement. We have better tools. When Crow wrote his paper, we didn't have the kinds of research information management systems we have now. Institutional repositories looked like a good bet. Institutional repositories have turned out to not be very effective, but an institutional repository as an integral part of a robust research information management system could be a very, very effective tool for a university. It's increasingly unnecessary to put open access versions in institutional repositories to work funded by the US government it will or may become unnecessary for publicly funded work from the EU. And there is this potential downside 
um, inadvertently directing people to versions of articles that have actually been corrected or retracted at the version of record level. So I conclude from all of that that we have reached a point where OA versions should be added to an institution repository only when that's the only option provi providing open access to the content of that article. And I think that really reshapes the work of the institution repository manager in thinking about where is the work of their institution being published, but where else is it being made available, and should I be looking at systems that will point my clients, my faculty, to the best possible version wherever that exists, rather than trying to fill my repository with versions that may in fact not be the most effective way of handling it. So that brings me to the synthesis piece. Um, so if we take Crow's article as the thesis and Lynch as the antithesis, not because he contradicts what Crow said, but looks at it in a diff different way, what can we suggest as a th synthesis for where institution repositories should go. I would suggest a number of principles. We use research information systems to highlight the institution's research output. Look at how the institution repository is a piece, a component of a more effective integrated research information management system. Reduce duplication of OA versions so that we are trying to point people to the best possible version of an article, if not the version of record, something that is going to be um, as close to that version of record as we can get, so that we can then focus on material that's outside the formal publishing program. There is so much happening at all of our institutions that would be valuable to share, and the institutional repository in that case is a fabulous vehicle for doing that. That, I think, is where the real successes over the last 10 years have been. Um, and I think many of you who have worked with your faculty on some of these projects have seen how rewarding and effective those are, where we can take material that would never have been available off campus before and share that with the world in a very effective way. And then to emphasize data, because I think we are really recognizing that for all of the emphasis we've seen over 20 years on open access to journal publications, it's when we can really start to provide access to the data that we start to really advance science in a very, very important and positive way. And again, institutional repositories are potentially an excellent vehicle for taking on a part of that job. So I would look back at what these two guys wrote 13, 14 years ago. Very visionary, very wonderful ways of looking at new roles for libraries, at taking these systems and using them to advance scholarship in tremendous ways, to advance the work of our institutions, to advance what our libraries can do. And I think it's reasonable for us now to step back, see what's worked, see what hasn't worked, reshape some of our focus, and really use those institutional repositories to pursue innovation, and most importantly of all, to do a lot more work on building this network of open repositories so that we really are providing a system across institutions to provide access to all of that material in very effective ways. So that is about what I wanted to say. And I don't have a watch on, so I don't know how much time I left. Um, so we have plenty of time to talk and ask questions, and I would be very eager to hear what you have to say, and particularly where you think I've gone off track, um, or where you think some of this has uh, some value for the work that you all are doing. There are microphones out there, and uh, that's where we stand. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Susan Davis from the University at Buffalo, and I'm interested in your thoughts about this network for the you know, open repositories. Who do you see developing that? Kind of, is that like NISO will be involved, or some other more informal organization? I'm just wondering like, where to direct energies in that direction. 
Yeah, there's a project called SHARE that I think some of you are familiar with. Um, it developed, it, it's a joint project of um, ARL, uh, the Association of American Universities, the Association of, um, the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, APLU. Um, it started out, uh, when the OSTP memo came out, there was a flurry of activity to try to figure out how to provide the kind of access that the memo was calling for. A group of publishers got together and developed a project called Chorus, um, which actually does a very effective job at this. And then a group of librarians and academics developed uh, SHARE. And they were originally really, I think, seen as sort of competitive. You know, here's the publishers dealing with it, here's the academics dealing with it. Um, they have since found more ways to cooperate. SHARE has really expanded its vision from uh, just looking at publication to looking at all sorts of research outputs. And their current project, they are trying to develop a system where they basically are harvesting metadata from existing repositories for all kinds of research outputs. So whatever goes into the repository, whether it's a publication or a data set or teaching material or whatever, um, they are trying to harvest that metadata into a system that becomes very easy to search. So you can develop a single search interface that would work across institutions. That's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. So I would encourage you to look and see what they're doing. Um, in Europe, there is an organization, the Coalition of Open Access Repositories, that is trying to do similar sorts of work. Um, I'm not as familiar with, with what they're doing. Um, I think at a, at a minimum, when you are looking at the infrastructure that you're dealing with, we've had for a long time some basic interoperability standards. And IR managers need to be sure that you are setting up your repository in such a way that the metadata meets those standards so that it can be harvested into some of these systems. Um, but, but I think those are the pieces. And it is, it is a little disappointing, I think, to look this many years on that there is still relatively little work being done. Now, Heather Joseph from Spark is speaking tomorrow. I suspect that this is going to be part of her theme because I, I mean, even though Heather and I disagree on a number of, of, of issues, I think we both share this sense that the potential for repositories is only really going to be met when we've done a much better job of figuring out how we search across all repositories. Yes. I'm Regina Reynolds, the uh, director of the US ISSN Center at the Library of Congress. And we get a lot of um, problems, if you want to call it challenges, with predatory publishing. Uh. And I see that as part of the um, now scholarly publishing ecosystem. But I also, in thinking about them and in thinking about why um, some of the institutional repositories haven't been as successful, why we have the traditional model still very strong, is the force of academia's publish or perish. And I'd like to hear your comments on how, at least my perception is, that is keeping the traditional role in place. It's also fueling this predatory publishing phenomenon. Um, yeah, you are absolutely right, and that is absolutely key. Um, about two months ago, I guess, I was um, attended a conference at George Mason University called the Open Scholarship Initiative, uh, and uh, papers from that conference are going to be published by George Mason very soon. We just finish submitting them, and I think they're going to be available soon. So uh, if you search on OSI 2016, that should help you find out more about this. Th this was an invitation-only uh, conference. Uh, there were about 200 people.
from across the various sectors. So we had librarians and publishers and academics and researchers looking at a whole variety of questions surrounding uh, scholarly publishing in very focused work groups. We did not have a specific work group on the whole publish or perish promotion or tenure piece, but in at least half of the work groups that came out as a key piece that until that is actually addressed, a lot of this other stuff that we talk about doing is really not going to change. Um, one of the th so one of the things that we talked about is we need to reach out more effectively to the organizations where the people who actually have some control over those issues get together and talk about their problems. So librarians get together and talk about the problem. Um, sometimes academics do. The people who have an opportunity to make a change are going to be the provosts, the chief academic officers. They're the people who go to the AAU meetings, the APLU meetings. Uh, about three years ago, a new organization formed an association of chief academic officers. So what I think we're going to try to do under the OSI umbrella is reach out to those groups. Um, I know some people in the Association of American Universities, and I know there is a group within that organization that is really looking at the promotion and tenure process in general. Um, so I think that there are opportunities in working with those sorts of organizations to look at the open access to the literature piece and see how that fits into the other things that the people who are really concerned with the process in general are trying to deal with. Um, just as within our academic institutions, we complain about all of the silos, all of our associations have the same problems. Librarians get together and talk with librarians about the problems, and publishers get together and talk with publishers about the problems. And we have to do a better job of going out and connecting and going to the meetings where those people are talking about shared problems and see where we can work together. But, but I think you are absolutely right. Until there is a significant change in the metrics for evaluating scholarship, um, a lot of the work that we've been doing in libraries is going to continue to exist just around the fringes. And we're not going to be able to make those changes until we are interacting at a much more fundamental level with provosts and chief academic officers and people who can, can make a change. Yeah. Hi, my name is Maria Agazari and I'm from Swarthmore College. And I work with our quote unquote IR, um, which really is more of a research information management system. Um, and I think it's interesting that I'm not really sure about how people in this room are approaching that, but for us, we've always been focused on our faculty output rather than only providing access. But like since the 1970s, we've had a faculty bibliography, and you know these new avenues of um, opportunities for publishing, like undergraduate research, that are mm -hmm. very popular. Um, uh, publishing data, which presents its own problems, with confidentiality and right. cleanup. So what I was wondering is. Since like we're already moving in that direction, I have a feeling that many other people are too, from just the providing access to really showcasing um, an institution's research output, what should we be focusing our energy on? Because sometimes it feels like, um, you know, someone will come to me and be like, you know, why are these years missing in the IRL? Like, why isn't this uh, representative? Should we go out and pay someone else to harvest our repository with their like messy metadata that doesn't meet mine? standards and standards of my colleagues. So where should our energy be focused? Because I have a feeling that that harvesting is not what you're speaking to. Right, right. Um, in all the years that I was a library director, and I should say one of the things about my current job that is, is actually quite refreshing after 25 years of running libraries, I have no staff and no budget. Um, <laughs> So I just get to run around and try to tell people what I think they ought to do without having any ability to force them to do that. Um, so it's 100% a political job. Uh, but when I was a library director and I would have questions like that for my staff, I would always say I'm very opportunistic. Um, there are more good things that need doing 
than we have time and energy to do. So let's look for the things that appear to get us the biggest benefit the fastest and focus on those things. So you find the faculty who are easy to partner with. You find the places that are easy to partner with. You put your energy there rather than sort of having an abstract, this is what ought to be done, so I'm going to bang my head against the wall and feel frustrated because that's what I think has to be done, even though I'm not making any headway, as opposed to, oh, if I worked over here, I could actually get some really good stuff done and work with some people who are interested in working with me. Now, the other thing that I would say about the research information management systems, and this is why, why I'm kind of excited about them, is, and, and we're in the process of working with Symplectic's Elements and with Vivo, is you can set up a system that gets at all of your faculty and requires very minimal cooperation on their part in order to get the metadata of their publications. Now, it doesn't address the actual getting the publications themselves, but in terms of implementing the system and presenting that information, um, it's still a lot of work putting these systems in place, but you can get at the work of the entire faculty, I think, more effectively than getting them one by one to buy in, which I think is one of the problems with the traditional institutional repository model. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. I, I'm Chris Bullock, and I'm an electronic resources librarian. And um, sometimes through troubleshooting, we see cases where like, smaller journals, maybe with less funding, might have access issues, um, the place where it's hosted changes multiple times, and some of that stuff can kind of disappear. Right. And so I wonder what you think the role of IRs might be when there's another open access version available now, but maybe it's coming from an organization with much less funding than one of these larger publishers. And so there might be the concern that that will either disappear or have insufficient metadata for discovery. Yeah, I, th I think that is potentially a good role for IRs. I think, I, I, as you're talking, I'm sort of thinking of it as, you know, is there an opportunity for an IR to um, sort of adopt a particular journal and, and set up a relationship with them and say, we are going to take on responsibility for being your particular archive. Now, again, I think one of the things that I always want to be careful about is what are all of the various opportunities available for them and is getting their content into my IR the best of the available opportunities? Uh, would they have an opportunity to participate in LOCKS, for example? Um, because I think participating in LOCKS, because of its distributed model, is a more effective um, preservation model. But certainly identifying those kinds of journals that you may have an interest in or a relationship with in some fashion and working with them to figure out what is the best option for them, uh, I think is a very, very useful role. And it may, well, it may well be that using that institutional repository turns out the best, to be the best way to do it. Yes? I'm David Nelson from Middle Tennessee State University. If you would have, what about some of these competing services like academia.edu? It seems like <laughs> faculty are already voting to a certain degree with their feet and putting their materials in that service. And I go there all the time. And, yeah. and I think that they actually, I find papers from scholars I'm familiar with there and not in their institutional repositories. Right. So they're making decisions about where they want to put their. Right, right. Um, Have we got another 45 minutes? <laughs> um, actually, speaking of being opportunistic, yeah, I mean, the, the folks behind Academia, EDU, behind ResearchGate, uh, they saw a gap and they're rushing out to fill it. Um, Mendeley does similar things. Um, it's clear that many faculty like the services that are available through something like ResearchGate 
or academia.edu. And I think it raises the question for us about what is it that they're doing that our institutional repositories haven't been. And I think part of it is the issue of that interoperability. You know, you put your stuff in ResearchGate and you know that everybody else out there, the tens of thousands or however many they claim they have, uh, that it's going to be out into that community and you can connect with people in that community. And our institutional repositories don't have that capability. Um, the flip side to that is I also want to be a little cautious and I think it goes back to the, you know, the previous comment about harvesting information that may not be as, may not be up to the standards that you want. I mean, all of the problems that I talk about with duplication deal with ResearchGate. Yeah, you can find a copy of an article, but which version is it? Um, and do you need to do a little bit more sleuthing with that? My current view, and I may be completely wrong, um, is that these are kind of transitional pieces and that we're going to see developments that will take some of the best pieces of these sorts of systems and evolve into more robust and better curated systems. But again, I think we need to look at what is the role of libraries and librarians in participating in that larger ecosystem. Hi, I'm Linda Clendenin from Indiana University. Uh -huh. I wanted to ask you about the role of IRs in dissertations. And uh, it seems to me that, especially in the humanities, that dissertations are one of the innovative areas in scholarship with images using media. And I wonder what role do we need to be playing that we may not? Um, I, th I think theses and dissertations is one of the huge success stories for IRs. Um, and I, I, you know, I sometimes feel, and, and this is, you know, sort of the one-on-one -on -one perceptions, and this may not be accurate, but I sometimes feel that some institutional repository managers who've been very successful with ETDs, but not so successful with the previous published content, feel sort of sheepish, as, as if, yeah, well, you know, we're doing okay over here, but the, the really good stuff that we're supposed to get is still really hard. Getting theses and dissertations Taking control of that, making that available through institutional repositories is fabulous. And relative to getting faculty to self-deposit, it's something that you can put together a program with the graduate school pretty effectively and really develop workflows and work streams that are very effective. There's a lot of questions about embargoes and how soon can you make dissertations available. Um, people in history seem to be completely or particularly paranoid these days and I understand that and so you have to work carefully with the different disciplines but I, I think that that's just a fabulous opportunity and um, I would think that every institutional repository should have at least part of their energy looking at how do they get involved in the uh, ETD stream. Yeah. Hi, my name is Ethan Pullman and I'm actually an instruction librarian so I, I don't deal with repositories very much but one of the questions that has recently come up in terms of repositories um, deals with you know the extent to which we include we, we often talk about repositories for faculty but we're also talking about the output for our, our undergraduate our honor per, uh, students and so I'm, I'm wondering where you stand on how far we should go with this. I, I think you should go as far as you can reach. Um, there's fabulous student work being done um, and students don't have all the problems we were talking about with worrying about promotion and tenure. You know you can get a group of smart students who are doing great work who would love to work with the institutional repository and see a way of making that available. Um, we do have it at UAB uh, what we refer to as the digital collections, uh, which uses um, DSpace as a uh, 
or Content DM as the platform, but it's really all kinds of different special collection stuff. And one of the best pieces on there, we have a really, really good ethnographic film program for undergraduates. And they do these fabulous little five and six minute films where they go out into the community. Well, we have those available now in the digital collections. Uh, that to me is a fabulous way of showcasing their work. This is high quality work. The students love it. It's a perfect example of the kind of thing that Lynch was talking about, that institutional repositories enabled us to take really good work being done at our institutions and make it available to the world. Yeah. Hello. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Ted Westerwald, Library of Congress. Um, I actually read the book, uh, Making Institutional ah. Repositories, work recently. And at the end of it, one of the big questions I had was most of it appeared to be about access. And there was relatively little about preservation, uh, which is what I tend to think of when I think of repositories. Sure. So my question is, and uh, from the question that Chris was asking, you mentioned uh, instead of an IR, you some locks. So the question I have is, to what degree is this, was it missing from the book, or is this just something that institutional repositories really are not doing, or should they be doing, or are they doing, I'm just not aware of. How do they intersect with digital preservation long term? Yeah, um, my impression, and I, I emphasize that, also from reading the book and other people that I've talked to, is relatively little attention has been paid to the real nuts and bolts of long-term preservation. I think most people who manage institutional repositories view them as long-term preservation vehicles. They, they assume that the material that they put in is there permanently. They assume that part of the role is to make it available uh, in perpetuity. Um, but the extent to which they've really looked at all of the technical issues involved in that, I, I don't see that getting quite as much attention, and that may just have to do with where in the life cycle of institutional repositories we are. But, but again, I think that that is something that needs more attention, um, because when you look at things like LOX and Portico or what NLM has done, real long-term preservation is really, really tough. And assuming that you can do it with a single standalone institutional repository, I, I think raises some significant questions. Yes. I'm Christy Degner from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill Health Sciences Library. And I just wanted to follow up with a comment about the student output. We have uh, created ways to self-deposit scholarly articles, but we've also made a special effort to work with students who are doing posters for student research days and talk about things that will disappear off the face of the earth faster. Right. The students are very excited about being able to archive their work and have, know where they can find it at a later point in time when they really need to cite it and to present it. So that's one of the areas that we've really started seeing an uptake. Yeah, and I, I, w I would add to that, if, if you've got a repository where you're really building citations, you're giving DOIs to these objects, um, you really are then starting to move into some of the kind of role that Crow was talking about. Because if they're, if they're research posters, they've gone through a level of peer review, you can give them citations, you can give them some permanence. Um, it's a tremendous service to those students, and it's a tremendous service to scholarship at large. So again, I think it's another area in which the benefit compared to the amount of work is huge as compared to the benefit-work ratio of some of the other ways that I think we've, we've spent energy with IRs. Um, and the uh, clock that my lovely wife now has, is showing me says we're at 10 after 5, um, and nobody is rushing to the mic, so I think we can wrap things up. And um, thank you very much. This was very useful to me. Thanks to all of you who came up to the microphone and talked about this, and I'm going to be around throughout the next couple of days. I would love to talk with more of you about all of this stuff if we have the opportunity.